Hi everyone, bonjour tout le monde, bonjour to à tous, bienvenue à tous à tous. Uh, Sarah, thank you. I just wanted to show up and say hi and say thank you to you for doing this. I really appreciate it. I can't tell you, I don't know if Emma told you, but there's been great enthusiasm for this workshop. Um, people have been signing up like crazy, and so we're really glad we opened it up. I'd just like to tell everyone when initially I invited Sarah to do this, Sarah said, well, would you mind if we invited the, the students from CSSR? And I said, sure. In fact, um, why don't we invite students from all of the scholarly societies who are part of the CCSR and that's I, I need to just mention the CCSR because it's co-sponsoring this event um, it is the Canadian Corporation for Studies in Religion for those of you who don't know and you're thinking what the heck is that uh, it's a conglomerate of scholarly societies essentially the society uh, it's a, a, a bilingual organization um, so we have uh, for example membership uh, um, ACEBAC, which is Association Catholique d'Etudes Bibliques au Canada. We have um, SQOR, Société Québécoise pour l'Étude de la Religion, um, CSSR, CSBS, um, CST. So some of you will recognize yourselves in those. If I can say this, if you're not a member of one of these scholarly societies and you're interested in study religion, join one. It's a great opportunity to sort of build an instant scholarly community and mentorship community. Um, what else does this? CCSR do. Um, we also sponsor a student travel grant. Every fall we have a competition and you'll find that on our website and I refer you to our website because we're trying to make it very relevant. So if you go there you'll see um, activities, you'll see some of the speakers that scholarly societies or our member societies are having. Um, join them and uh, trying to try to get yourself invited to those um, events as well. We sponsor studies in religion, Sciences Religieuses, and this is, as I'm sure most of you know, if not all of you, the, one of the foremost journals on the study of religion, and certainly the foremost one, I think, in Canada on the study of religion. Um, so we, we have a, a wide range of activities, um, and many of them benefit directly students. So I just wanted to mention the organization, because uh, it was only until a few years ago that I actually understood what the CCSR was. So I spent my student days in the dark, although I was studying in sociology, so we likely wouldn't have heard about it anyway. So um, I think this is uh, all I wanted to say. I just wanted to mention the CCSR. Welcome, Sarah. Thanks, Sarah. Welcome, everyone. Say hello to everyone. And um, thank Emma. Uh, Emma, thank you so much for um, uh, doing the organizational work of this and putting putting this uh, together. Um, I really, really appreciate all your hard work on this. And uh, we also, I also want to mention Amy Saville, who is our information officer for the, the Non-Religion and Complex Future Project. And Amy kind of works behind the scenes a lot, um, making sure the posters are, are put out and information is put out in an accurate way so that uh, people are aware of what it is we're doing. So, Emma is actually going to introduce Sarah, and Sarah, if you're okay with it, I'll probably lurk in the background so that I can learn a little bit about statistics you and stats, can you? Lurk away, okay. Lori. <laughs> All right, great. thank you. All right, thank you so much, Lori. Um, so, I would like to also welcome you all to today's workshop, How the Heck Do I Find and Use Statistics Canada Data on Religion and Non-Religion, a, a crash course for graduate students. My name is Emma Robinson, and I'm the project manager for the Non-Religion and a Complex Future Project. I'd like to begin today with a land acknowledgement. While we gather virtually for, from, for today's event from places near and far, we acknowledge the Indigenous peoples of all lands that we are on today, and acknowledge the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of First Nations, Métis, and Inuit peoples across Canada. The Non-Religion in a Complex Future Project is based at the University of Ottawa. Please join us as we pay respect to the Algonquin people who are the traditional guardians of this land. We acknowledge their long-standing relationship with, the, with this territory, which remains unceded. We acknowledge the traditional knowledge keepers, both young and old, and we honor their courageous leaders, past, present, and future. Thank you. And now to introduce today's facilitator. Sarah Wilkins Laflam is an assistant professor in the Department of Sociology and Legal Studies at the University of Waterloo and a collaborator on the Non-Religion in a Complex Future Project. Her research interests include quantitative methods, as you can tell, uh, sociology of religion, immigration and ethnicity, and political sociology. 
And with that, over to you, Sarah. Yeah, thanks, Emma. Welcome, everyone. Great to see many of you here today. All right, let's get started. I'm going to share my screen. Uh, okay, so here, got the workshop. Okay, I, I wasn't sure on timing, but we're, we've got a, enough material for about an hour and a half. But if, if that's too long, then we can cut the third, <laughs> the last bit. It's not as important. Uh, but the whole point of the workshop today, uh, as you can gather from the title, is to explore together some of StatsCan's data. Uh, this workshop's really meant for a beginner audience who, you know, maybe you guys do work more with qualitative data or do more theory work. Um, but you've, you know, you found yourself wanting to use statistics. Maybe you've used them a bit before to kind of complement, supplement the work that you do, um, but aren't really sure uh, of all the tools available to you, would kind of like maybe a brush up as well, maybe you've used some of this data before, but haven't for a while. And so the idea here is a bit of a focus on StatsCan data today. Um, I'll talk a little bit about other religion and non-religion uh, data out there, um, but mainly on StatsCan data. And we'll look at a, a few kind of different ways that you can access that data, what's good about it, what's not so good about it, you know, what you can do with it, different kind of levels as well. Like if you just want a kind of a quick use of statistics, what you can do for that, all the way up to kind of if you want to do your own more advanced analyses of statistics. We obviously won't get into like statistical modeling or anything like that today, but we'll talk about kind of like different levels of use of uh, of this data. Okay, so just like a quick introduction here on, you know, what, what the aim is here. Uh, why, why should you care? <laughs> why should I look up StatsCan data? Why should you look up StatsCan data on religion, non-religion, anything to do uh, with, you know, the kind of fields and topics that our, our societies and projects cover? Well, you know, the fact is, is that uh, even if you are mainly a qualitative person or mainly a theory person, uh, stats can be useful, right? So stats can provide maybe a bit of context, uh, maybe a bit more of a global overview of a topic before you kind of go more into depth with your qualitative of data or your theoretical arguments. And so this can be like, you know, if you're working with a certain group, you know, how large is the group in the area that you're studying? Uh, you know, what has this group grown? Has it shrunk over time? Uh, you know, where are the demographic compositions of, the, of a certain group or a population that you're interested in? These are all things that statistics are, are good for and that you might want to kind of use to complement your own existing non-quantitative work uh, if you want. Um, you know, a lot of us don't always have the time to collect our own survey data or our own stats data. Uh, it, it is, you know, a certain amount of work. I do do some of that. Like I do run my own surveys, but a lot of the time um, I, 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 I go and look for existing data instead because there's a lot of great quality, free existing statistical data out there. And again, today we're focusing on what StatsCan has to offer. Um, and even if you are collecting your own quant data, you know, maybe you're working with a, a religious group or a nonprofit group and you want to run a survey within that group. Well, maybe you also want to go out and see what other existing statistics are out there they're related to your topic or related to your group. Uh, so see what others have published in terms of statistics uh, for that group. So it's it's a wonderful wide world out there. I will try, you know, Lori mentioned that there had been a lot of enthusiasm for this workshop. That's great to hear. I'll try not and kill that enthusiasm with a really boring workshop. I'll try and make it fun and engaging. I really love statistics. I'm a big fan of them. Not everyone is though, right? Numbers can sometimes, uh, people can scare people. Some people really don't like math or numbers at all. But, you know, you push, if you're one of those people, that's okay. You, you're, you're one of many, but push beyond that because there are lots of great things that stats can offer and you just got to know where to look and, and kind of best ways to use it for, you know, different levels of, you know, uh, use of statistics. You know, even if you're not a big quantitative researcher, that's okay. You can still use statistics in a meaningful way um, in otherwise different types of work. And another question I often get related to, you know, why should I bother to go and get uh, data from the source, like say StatsCan's website or from the data sets themselves, rather than just taking what's already been published uh, in books and journal articles, in media articles, right? Because there's a lot of statistics that are out there that are already published in other writings, right? So that can be like a, a CBC News article, that can be a journal article from a well-known researcher, that can be a book that has different you know, tables and graphs and statistics in it. And, you know, those are obviously good sources, uh, depending on what you want to do with them. But uh, there are advantages to actually going getting the stats yourself from the source. Um, one, you can often get more recent statistics because by the time that the statistics are in the published materials, it's been like 
probably about five years by the time you analyze the data, you go through the peer review process, you actually get the work published. Most stats, you'll notice this in journal articles or books are, are at least five years, if not more like 10 or 15 years old. And so if you want something more recent, that's when you go straight to StatsCan and get it straight to them because they're putting stuff out, not in real time, but quite regularly uh, through their different resources. It also might be more what you want, right? Like what's in a published article, you know, might be a little bit related to your topic, but it might not be exactly what you're looking for. So that's when you can go and get something yourself uh, on the website uh, or on the different, some of the different resources we're gonna explore together today. And also because uh, I'll try and put this nicely, sometimes the statistics in published work are not great, are actually not that good quality, um, or how they're used is not that good quality. So, um, you know, there's different things, not all statistics are equal. There's different things that can make a statistic better quality or poorer quality. You know, it's not like a, it's not a binary, it's not black and white, but it is, you know, there are some things that make a better statistic. And by better statistic, I mean something, uh, an estimate that's more representative of what you'd find actually in the real world on the ground within a certain population. And this is my little visual here um, up on the slide, is that, you know, there's a lot of things that can go wrong <laughs> when you're getting to a statistical estimate that means that you shouldn't pro probably shouldn't trust that statistical estimate. So things can go wrong during the data collection. For example, maybe the statistic is coming from a relatively poor quality sample. You know, maybe the person only surveyed like 500 of their closest friends and didn't make the effort to go and get a random sample. I'll talk more about that in a minute in which case it's not a very good quality estimate for a population. Um, or there can be issues when you actually run the analysis, right? The next phase, we're actually crunching the numbers. There can be mistakes that are made during that phase. There can be, you know, people with less training might not have made the best decisions at that analysis phase. And so you end up with poor quality results as well. Also, what I've noticed, for example, in the fields of religious studies, um, uh, for example, a field that doesn't necessarily have a lot of quantitative methods training uh, for students, um, a lot of scholars want to use statistics, then some of them use them well. But I've noticed over the years that even, you know, the best religious studies scholars sometimes misinterpret what a statistic actually means, or only see one interpretation when in fact, there could be like three other interpretations <laughs> of what the statistic is actually telling us. And because everyone else doesn't have stats training in the field, they're not, not necessarily, can't really pick up on that, right? And so that's something you need to be a bit careful with uh, as well. That obviously comes from experience and from training, but I'll talk a little bit about that today. So there are some things that you're looking for for good quality statistic. Um, and that's why we, we like to kind of start and focus with StatsCan data is because a lot of these things are done quite well with Statistics Canada, right? They're a government department. They're massive. They have thousands of employees, some of which I know, some of whom I actually related to in Ottawa. Um, and so, you know, they're making sure at different levels that the quality control is there, right? So that's data collection. Uh, that's uh, so when they go and gather survey data or where they gather institutional data from different levels of government, from different uh, public institutions. When they crunch the numbers, right, their people are well trained. Um, they're very careful to kind of, you know, not overstate what the statistic is saying in their own reports. And so just this is the visual I have up here is that, you know, the reported statistic you see at the end is like the tip of the iceberg. There's a lot going on underneath. And sometimes, you know, it, you know, some of this, what's going on underneath, you can pick up quite quickly. Sometimes you need more training to kind of really figure out what happened and what's going on. And so that's kind of like stats cans there and is sort of doing it for you. I'm not saying they're perfect, but they are a relatively good quality institution and have good people uh, producing pretty good quality stats. All right. So the advantage of stats candida is it's its real advantage, at least from my viewpoint, is it has the best quality sample of respondents available in the country. Um, so StatsCan usually with its surveys is working with big samples, like we're talking tens of thousands of people. And not only are they large, right? Size does matter when it comes to a sample for quantitative data, but it's also the, the random sampling techniques used to get those tens of thousands of people, right? So they are the closest thing that we have to what we call a probability sample. Uh, in the country where everyone across a whole population has an equal chance of taking part in the survey. And that produces a representative sample or a more representative sample that, you know, your estimates, your statistic that you find with that sample, you can generalize to the wider population. Be like, oh, okay, here in my sample of 35,000 people, there's 30, 
23% who say they're of no religion, I can be relatively confident that's a, a reasonable estimate of what we'd see across the whole population of 38 million Canadians, right? About 33% say they have no religion. And also the nice thing about StatsCan data is for surveys, um, they have quite high response rates or relatively high <laughs> response rates. That's somewhere between 40 and 60% these days, which I know might sound low to some of you, but these days for surveys, that's actually quite high. We're kind of past the golden age where everyone would answer a survey because they didn't get asked that often. They all had a landline telephone. So you could phone, you could have a phone book, you could phone a random sample of people and they'd probably answer your survey because they had nothing better to do. I don't know, or were into a survey because it was new, uh, those days are gone, right? Like most people are exposed to tons of surveys, will most likely not answer them. And so StatsCan still gets a pretty good response rate because people kind of recognize, oh, it's Statistics Canada. It's, you know, they're producing uh, data to hopefully impact social policy. Uh, so, you know, I'll, I'll answer I'll answer their survey or in the case of the census, they're forced to. <laughs> You're forced to answer the census. There can be penalties if you don't. Um, as well as their institutional level data, right? This is other types of data, things like migration data, birth data, death data, um, things like crime statistics, all of that sort of thing, thing, numbers that are fed to StatsCan through other bodies, so through other levels of government, through other public institutions. StatsCan is, is quite good at collecting all of that data, economic data, that sort of thing. So that's the advantages of using StatsCan data uh, and including StatsCan data on religion and non-religion. Uh, however, in our field, there is a few disadvantages of using StatsCan data. Um, you know, not enough to, to not use it, but enough that it's worth keeping in mind. Uh, a nice, I'm trying to say this nicely, but the government doesn't seem to care much about religion or non-religion these days. And so they don't include many variables on it in a survey when they do run a survey, say like the general social survey, that's a big survey they run each year or other surveys or the census. So for example, there's usually a good like many language questions or there's many questions on like employment. There's a number of questions on like, you know, social kind of income inequality situation because that's what the government seems to care more about uh, in terms of social policy. I'm not saying they're, they're right or wrong on this. I'm saying this is their kind of priorities. Um, whereas there's, Usually maybe only one question on religious affiliation in the census, for example, or a very small number, like three or four in the general social survey on religion, religiosity, beliefs, spirituality. And so we're kind of dealing with, we have a great sample of people with these data, but we're only dealing with a small amount of variables, which only give us limited information about what people think and do and believe and behave when it comes to religion. So that's kind of the trade-off that you have with StatsCan data. And I'll talk a little bit more about later later on where you can find other types of religion data that's maybe kind of richer and more variables on, on the topics that interest us, but also the sample quality might not be quite as good. But that being said, I still like StatsCan data. I still think it has value. So that's why we're having the workshop today. Okay, so the rest of the workshop, I've kind of split into three parts, kind of like three levels of StatsCan data that we can look at and that we can easily find and access for free online. So these are statistics that have already been analyzed by people at StatsCan and they're available on their website. So we'll go to the StatsCan website together. We'll look to see if they're look to see what their different features are. Um, and then there's the tabulation with Odyssey. So I'll talk more about that. So that's where you can start crossing variables in a relatively user-friendly, easy way. And then I'll talk quickly at the end about, you know, if you want to go further, if you actually want to download the data set or data file yourself and do more advanced statistical analyses with statistical modeling software, I can talk a little bit about, um, you know, how you get started if you haven't already done that before. And that's what we call secondary analysis. All right, so let's start with uh, stats that are have already been crunched or analyzed by StatsCan and are out there in their final kind of estimate version, uh, if you want, which is either like a number or a percentage or maybe a rate of some kind. Well, I'll show you some examples, but when I talk about estimate, I'm usually talking about any kind of statistic that's estimating something about a population. So when you're starting with StatsCan, obviously a, a good place to start is their website, right? Um, some of you may have visited their website before. It's a great resource. You know, uh, it's a little bit clunky as government websites go. Um, that's kind of par for the course, but it is still relatively uh, a good website with lots of good features. So I've put the link here in the slides. You know, you can easily just Google Statistics Canada and you'll get to their main website. 
And when you arrive, it looks something like this, right? This is sort of the homepage that I've put on the slide here. And so there's a lot going on. I'll, I'll switch my screen in a moment to go to the actual web browser. If you have a second device open or a second screen, you're welcome to go to StatsCan's website and follow along with me or just follow along on this main screen as I share mine. Um, but yeah, there's lots of features. I won't cover all of them with you today, but there's a couple of good ones that I figured um, are worth exploring, especially because uh, very soon the 2021 census data will be available. It's not available yet. Uh, so if you were hoping to see it today, sorry, <laughs> it's not quite out yet, um, but it is coming. Um, you, the uh, StatsCan has like a release calendar for that data. They release kind of different chunks in different parts throughout the year. So that's going to happen over the course of 2022. Uh, for example, the last round of census data in 2016 came out the February after in 2017 on their website. So it started coming out. So we should probably be seeing the 2021 census data sometime soon. It's always hard to tell with the pandemic um, when exactly that will be because things have slowed down a bit. Um, but it should be out, up there uh, sometime soon, including the religious affiliation question, which I think a lot of people are interested in. And that's asked every 10 years on the census. And so we'll go and look at, you know, when that data appears, where it will appear and where you can explore it on the website. And also I want to go and look at uh, where you can look up StatsCan publications and reports that also have a lot of statistics in them. Okay, so let's do that together. You'll be notice I'll be switching my screen share a lot. So just be patient with me. This is the kind of best I can do when it comes to Zoom. But if you should be able here now to see, this is StatsCan's main homepage. Um, and if ever, for some reason, you can't see what I'm talking about, or you need me to repeat something, just feel free to jump in, unmute yourself and jump in. I'm happy to happy to do so. And so, yeah, this is what you get from their main uh, webpage. I, I, I selected English, so this is their English homepage. Uh, so you'll see kind of, you know, on the left here, there's kind of like some news and some uh, stuff, recent publications that came out. On the right, you have key economic indicators for the country and population indicators. So you can see we're at, uh, we're at just over 38 million estimated population uh, in the country. You have like, you know, the unemployment rate, uh, which looks normal again during the pandemic. At the start of the pandemic, it was like super high. It was like 14%. It was crazy. But now it's back down more to normal numbers for that. You have GDP per quarter, that sort of that sort of thing. And then if you keep scrolling down, you have what I call their different features or, or tools, if you want, on their website. Um, some of these, I'll let you explore all of these. You know, some of these I find more helpful than others. But two that I want to explore with you today was the radar analyses and the census profile tools. Um, but there's lots more. So if ever, I'll let you go and explore some more on your own time. Uh, if you're if you're looking for something to do, if you're procrastinating, or if you're looking for a, a specific statistic, you can explore. A lot of this stuff is pretty user friendly. It's meant for a general public audience. So usually it's, you can understand most of it. But let's start by going to this read our analysis tool, right? So again, on, on the homepage, you scroll down and you get to read our analysis. So this is kind of a database of all the publications and stuff and stuff like infographics, maps, lots of stuff that StatsCan does by topic, right? So you can uh, search by subjects, you can search by their own subjects, or you can put in your keyword. If you're not familiar with StatsCan's terminologies that they use like words they like, I would recommend you start by using their own kind of subjects and you click on one and see what you get. Um, but you can try keywords as well. So for example, in the keyword, I'm I'm going to put religion, and I'm going to search, and I guess see what I get. And, you know, some of this is relevant. Some of it might not be as relevant. Um, you know, you have religion in Canada. Oh, this looks pretty recent, actually. Uh, this was uh, released late uh, last October, by the looks of it. Uh, you have some stuff related to immigration and diversity, which is, again, more terms that, can, uh, that StatsCan uses. You know, they don't use religion a whole lot as a term and what they produce in terms of statistics, but it is there. You have things like social trends. You can just kind of go down again. Some of this is more relevant than others. Um, but here I want to show you number six here, the study Religiosity in Canada and its evolution from 1985 to 2019. This was that report that we did another webinar through the NCF with in December. You know, a few of us, myself, Peter, Jack, um, Brian, got together and uh, talked about this report. So this is a report that you can just 
look on the website, you can read on the website, or you can download as a PDF. And so this has information from the general social survey uh, since the mid 80s, and looks at religiosity trends over time. So this is a report written by some uh, an employee at StatsCan and that they've published themselves, and it has lots of good quality statistics in it, and some interpretation of those statistics or some key kind of findings related to those trends. So you can click on that. I, I won't go further than that, but there's lots of different options here. And again, you can, you know, explore, try different keywords, look through the different subjects, looking to see what you can find. And this can be part of your literature review, right? So if you're looking for a topic, you're starting to study it, you want to see what's already been published on it. Well, this can be part of it is what's, what do we have in terms of statistics that are out there. Okay, so that was a kind of, I, I like that feature. I, I've found lots of um, helpful literature through the years that read our analysis literature. I'm back to the StatsCan homepage, by the way. Um, uh, whereas some of these other features, I've tried them and I've never really been successful at finding things <laughs> I was looking for. So, uh, so you know, maybe hopefully you'll have more success, but you'll notice that some of these tools you'll find more useful than others. Um, and, you know, it's not necessarily the ones I'm showing you today. Some of you, you might like, and I just don't like for some reason, uh, and that's okay, right? So I think there's a little bit of everything for everyone here, which is good. Okay, the other tool I want to go and um, show you from on their main homepage under most requested is the census profile, the 2016 census. Now, this is where when they release the 2021 census, this will change to census profile 2021 census. And so like I guess, my best guess is that, that will happen sometime in February, but it might take a little bit longer uh, with the 2021 census. Every 10 years, it's a bigger census, more questions, and so maybe it might take them longer to process. Uh, we'll see. But it's that at, this, at some point, this will change to the 2021 census. So everything we do with the census profile feature, we can do with the 2021 data once it's ready. So we're going to click on this now. And this is, I don't know if any of you have used this before, but this is a tool that you can search a region any region in Canada, it goes down quite detailed. So it can be a city, it can be a town, it can be a municipality. It can also be at the higher level, like a province or, or a territory. Um, but so you search by your region's name that you're interested in, and it gives you all the census data for that area. So uh, does someone want to shout out uh, their favorite town to me, their favorite city that they want to look up? Come on, someone, someone shout it out. Unmute yourselves. Shout out where you want me to look. St. Albert. St. Albert. Oh my God. Is that Alicia? Where is that? <laughs> is that um, like Alberta somewhere? I think so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. How do you spell it exactly? Like, is it a full saint? <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. I think that's exactly what it is. Yeah. I know. I'm not finding anything. Okay. Usually it gives you a few options. <laughs> <laughs> Alicia Brooks. That's good. Oh, I there know. We go. Uh, there we oh, go. No, it's Quebec. Is this what oh, you want? It? Uh, yeah, it's I guess like so. Yeah. It's like in Quebec. Okay. So there's St. Advaya, which is a mix of <laughs> Quebec. But that's it. So you look up a town name and it'll give you a few options. I'll give you just one other example, then we'll come back to St. Albert, I promise, Alicia. But if you put in, say, like where I am, Waterloo, and you hit enter, you'll get like all the available options. So there's like a small town in Quebec that's also called Waterloo, but I would probably be more interested in the city in Waterloo in Ontario that I'm in. So yeah, anyway, so you put the region name that you're interested in. If you're not sure if it goes down to that level of detail, uh, just search for it and you'll get a sense of, you know, try things out and see if your region in the end is there. But okay, we're going to St. Albert, it's municipality in Quebec. We're clicking on it. Let's see what St. Albert has to offer. <laughs> I'm assuming it's a very small place. Oh, it is. It's like a 16. For the record, oh, right. for the for the record, there is a Saint Albert in Alberta as well. I don't know why it's not coming up, but that's oh, okay. That's interesting. <laughs> well, well, the well, no, this is a good time to try this out. Saint um, is always a problem, right? Because it sometimes, like my dad, where he lives in Saint Andrews, New Brunswick, it's like just St. It's not the full Saint. So sometimes you have to just write St. Yeah, here we go. That was a that's it. So now you notice what I did. I just wrote St. T. Albert and I get the city in Alberta. Okay, let's do that. <laughs> Sorry if there's anyone from St. Alba, Quebec, but we're gonna switch over to the city in Alberta. But yeah, so you play around with it. So see how it's written on Google Maps and try that way, basically, and see what you get and then play around with it until you actually get the place you want. Okay, so we're on uh, the 2016 census data for St. Albert, Alberta. Uh, so um 
just kind of quickly looking here, uh, they always change the, the layout of this a little bit. So anyways, um, there is, you might have noticed um, in the previous web page, there's also a little link where you can click on the map to see what geographic area this is actually covering. So if you're not quite sure, you can do that. That was on the previous page when you type in the name of the place and you find it. But then once you click on it, uh, this is it, you gain St. Albert uh, in Alberta. Okay, so St. Albert, the city is quite a bit bigger. <laughs> it's uh, just under 66,000 people in 2016. So you see, I can, I can see that from this total here in 2016. And then you scroll down and you've got all the kind of different census information. And at the moment, it's in what StatsCan calls the counts. So that's like actual numbers. So for example, there's just over 10,000 people who are 65 years or older in St. Albert, uh, Alberta. And then you go down and all the information that was in the 2016 census is there. Notice that religion is not there because religion was not included as a question in the 2016 census. I'll come back and show you where you can find religion data. It's a little bit older until we get the new 2021 data. So anyway, so it's there. We do have, uh, for example, place of birth, ethnic origin, I believe is, is part of all of this. And so, yeah, there's a lot of, lot of data, right? Like it's, it's a, that's a lot of numbers. <laughs> and then there's a notes under the table explaining some key things about each variable that you need to know. But there's a ways you can navigate this, right? So you can under topics here at the top, you can instead of seeing all the data, you can instead uh, select your the, the types of data that you're actually interested in. Oh, there's COVID-19 relevant indicators. What's that? This is new. Okay. <laughs> And by the way, you have to, I always forget this, you have to select it, then you have to submit, hit submit or else it doesn't change the table. So you select your topic, you hit submit, then it changes the table. Okay, uh, interesting. So like COVID-19 indicators is like density of the population, right? Number of people in the household. So I guess it's all kind of data that they might use when they're building like say the medical, um, the health models of like predicting the number of cases and stuff. This data is not the only data they use for that, but can help to kind of give a sense of what the population makeup in areas. That's interesting. So the other thing you can change instead of seeing things all as just the number of people, you can instead see percentages. And that's stats can calls that rates. So you just click rates instead. And again, you click on submit. I don't know if you get any rates here. And then, so for example, you see here that like the people who are 65 years and older in St. Albert, uh, they represent about 15% of the whole population of the city, right? So yeah, so you get your percentages instead where relevant, right? So we could look at something else. We could look at uh, ba -ba 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 education. That's always a fun one for grad students. So we have uh, education, submit, and then that's in rates so in percentages. So for example, if you want to know how many people have a master's degree in St. Albert, in Alberta, is 3.9% of the population, which isn't that bad for a more rural area in Alberta. Uh, and uh, only 0.5% of the city has earned a doctorate. So this is where you can find um, interesting data. Uh, obviously, this is more like demographic data of a certain area. But when the 2021 data is released, you'll see religion there as well. So you'll see religion come up as an option, and then you'll get the religious affiliation. So you can see how many people in the area identified as Muslim, for example, um, the, the number of people and how much that represents across the whole population in percentage, right? So um, at the moment, currently, while we wait for the 2021 20, data, the existing data that's out there is from 2011. So the National Household Survey, which replaced the long-form census in 2011. Think back, way back to when Harper was still in power and there was a big scandal. He replaced the long-form census with a survey. In the end, it probably didn't have much of a difference, uh, to be honest. But um, so it, it's called the National Household Survey in 2011. Uh, we're back to census in 2021. So just to, just to mix you up. Um, but to find that uh, easy way to do that, so from anywhere in the StatsCan website, you can just call the National Household survey 2011 profile and profile again this is the census profile we just looked at but there's the same feature with the 2011 data as well so if that's if you're looking for religion data even though it's getting a bit old now you can still find it on the website national household survey 2011 profile you search that and you'll find you should find the tool here it's number two in the search history national household survey profile and it's the same idea so you put in your um or it should be. <laughs> see, this is always fun trying these things. Uh, is it going to work? Nope, oh, never mind. Okay, this is different. My bad. <laughs> it worked the last time I tried it. 
Ah, good times. Uh, okay, let's try this one. Number three instead. That's called the same thing. Fun times. Okay, this is the right one. <laughs> this is where we put in the regional names. Again, I'm glad we, we have these troubleshooting issues here because this does happen, right? Sometimes you get like a few options that look the same. So you just got to try them out and it's okay. Just play around with it until it works for you. But let's look at like, say, uh, Ontario as a province this time. And so again, this is with the 2011 data, Ontario province, we're clicking on it. And again, the same idea, same type of table. But now if you select a view, you get a larger amount of topics, including religion. Because in 2011, they asked the religious affiliate, uh, affiliation question in the National Household Survey. So we'll click on religion and we click submit. Now, the fun thing with this is that they, they don't have the, the rate option for the 2011 data. So you have to calculate the percentage yourself, I believe. I don't know if they've changed that or if there's a way to do it, but usually you have to end up calculating the percentage. They'll only give you the number of people. So bear with it. It's kind of like this is the old version of it. But you see here at the tabs at the top, you can have you can click on map to see what I'm referring to, right? We're looking at Ontario. And then you have the data itself, and I selected religion. And so you can see, for example, in Ontario, uh, there's just under 600,000 people who identify as Muslim in the 2011, uh, 2011 National Household Survey, and they've actually extrapolated that to represent the kind of whole population, if you will, because that survey only surveyed 20% of households, but they've calculated to give you an estimate of the whole population. So that 600,000 is basically, or just under 600,000, is meant to be like the percentage of Muslims in Ontario sorry, the number of Muslims in Ontario living in a private household. Let's put it that way. Um, right, but don't forget, this is an estimate. It's probably the best estimate we have in, in the country for this, but it's still an estimate because it's based off of 20% of households and not everyone, right? Because the long form census or this survey was only run with 20% of households. So there's some footnotes here explaining a few little key details, um, but it's interesting. So for example, uh, a, out of curiosity, we'll see, but I think one change we're going to see in the 2021 census is that the number of Muslims is probably going to outnumber some of the bigger, what we used to consider some of the bigger mainline Protestant groups, but which have shrunk enormously over the years. And so now when we're looking at, say, the Anglican or the United Church, they're still, in 2011, they were still numerically larger than, say, those who identified with different Islamic communities in the province of Ontario. But I bet you that might be something that we see as a shift in 2021, because you know, many of you know this, uh, a lot of the kind, uh, some of the non-Christian minority groups have been growing, especially due to immigration, especially in provinces like Ontario, as uh, whereas the mainline Protestant groups, so we're talking about, you know, here, some of these bigger, what used to be the bigger Christian groups have been shrinking for the last many decades and are now quite old on average. Their members have a very high age on average and uh, have not been gaining from immigration. So that might be a change we might see. I don't know. We'll see if it actually, if it's enough to like a tipping point to reverse it, uh, to see if Muslim groups are larger uh, in 2021. But it's probably, if it's not going to be that, it's going to be very close to that in 2021. So that's the StatScan website. Um, any questions at this point? I know that was a lot. It's probably, don't worry, I'm not going to spend this much time on every, every website we talk about today. This was the one I wanted to show you in more detail. But any questions so far? Things you're not sure about? Things you're wondering about? So one, okay. of, one of the people yeah. in the chat asked if that information was free. And so that information is free. So what kind of information? Is there any information that is behind a paywall? Oh, good question, Alicia. Uh, I don't, there's nothing that's behind a paywall as such, but there is stuff that's harder to, that you need probably more training to access. And I'll talk about that. My, my presentation basically goes from like the easiest stuff to access to the most difficult stuff to access. StatsCan has made a real effort uh, over the past few years to make everything free to, especially to Canadian researchers. There was a time where you would have to pay for like a data set to be sent to you back in the day, they'd send it by mail and you like analyze it with like an old computer or something. Uh, those days are gone. So most of it's, it's all digital now and it's just at different levels of access. Um, the main concern for StatsCan is not so much the payment, but it's more the confidentiality of respondents, right? So they, what's on their website, what we just looked at together, um, there's not, you can't identify like one person with that data. They make sure that you can't. So they can't say like, oh, look at St. Albert in this postal code. There's a 
this one Muslim living here, we can identify it. In theory, with census data, you can with the raw data, but they don't make that public, right? So if you want to access the raw form of the data with more detail, you have to go through a series of security clearance checks. I've gone through certain levels of that. Some of it they'll only leave to their employees, like the most sensitive data is only their employees that can access it, but I can access kind of more detailed versions um, that, and I just have to like sign forms to make sure I'm not disclosing any sensitive information or, or that goes against the confidentiality of the respondent. And I have to make sure that when I publish things that I'm rounding them off, that I'm making sure that the data that I'm publishing, you can't identify specific individuals with it. So that's what they're more concerned about. So it's less a question of money, it's more a question of kind of where you access their data, um, what you need to access their data and how much training you need to actually run stats models with their data. Yeah, so I'll talk more about that as we go through, but that's a great question, Alicia. All right, thumbs up, cool. Thank you, by the way. I'm not super monitoring the chat because I'm between a few screens here, but uh, thanks for that. And if you have a question, it's good to kind of just ask it out loud. Um, that's probably more helpful, but I'm just looking through this just now. Okay. All right, so let's get, let's move on now. One, yeah, sorry. Go sorry, for one it. more question. Go for it, Chris. Yeah. Is there any way to find out um, like the breakdowns of the religious others? Aha. Well, yes. Okay. Uh, there is, but again, um, because they will only release larger categories to make sure again that you can't identify one individual in a certain place, because some of their geographic breakdowns are quite detailed, right? Like, they, like we saw Saint Albert in Quebec was a quite small community. There was about what sixteen hundred people there, um, and so they will only have general categories like say Buddhist, Muslim, uh, Sikh, uh, some general bigger Christian categories. There's more breakdown between the Christian categories because there's more people in them so that allows them to break them down and so to still not identify like one person in a small geographic area with that data but that's why they're keeping some of those categories a bit broader so for example they don't break down between islamic traditions so you don't see like sufi uh specifically or ismaili um right and so that's when you need um the, you need to go and access the more detailed data and that's when sometimes you have to do that through the research data center which is like a protected computer lab you need a security check to get through to go and use it there and then you run the analysis and there's like a stats can employee there that's there to help you but also to like monitor you <laughs> so that you're not like trying to take out confidential data to use it to like sell stuff to people or to like you know or more nefarious purposes i'll talk more about that as we work our way through because that's that you can access that if you want but it does take a bit more time and training uh to do that whereas the what's what's easily available on the website it might not be perfect but maybe that's good enough for the amount of time that you're willing to put into it sort of thing so we'll come back to that but great question Chris cool all right so that was StatsCan's website just as a kind of quick side note here it's not the only website obviously with statistics in Canada on religion and non-religion there's lots of other um, good places that have uh, especially public opinion data on religion and different things related to religion in Canada um, so I've I've put um, some of the in the slides there you'll find some links here to some of the kind of more common public opinion institutes in Canada some of these I'm sure you've heard of um, uh, like Angus Reid like Leger they run they have their own way of running surveys they have like large pools of online registered people like say 100 or 150,000 people they'll survey like say 2,500 uh, respondents from that larger pool, they'll run our survey with those 2,500 respondents. And it's often on topical issues. So things are in the media, but it can also be on religion, non-religion, spirituality. Um, so for example, just to quickly, uh, I'll just quickly, I won't show all of these to you. They're here. You can all just go and explore them. But Angus Reid is, is a, one of those main public institutes. I've got their website open. I'll just show you and we'll just have a quick look together. Um, so, uh, and they're, they have quite good stuff. They're probably the group that has the most on religion, even though, um, uh, what was I going to say? Leger does quite a bit as well. Give me a moment here. I'm just going to go to it. Here we go. 
Da, 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 da. So this is Angus. You should be able to see Angus Reed's main homepage here. So they, they run surveys regularly, right? Because StatsCan data is very good for demographics. It's very good for some historical data. It's very good for economic data. But it's very rare that StatsCan will ask people how they feel about something, what they think about something, their values. StatsCan doesn't do that so much. Um, they leave that to public opinion institutes who do their own surveys who are interested in like what people think about something. So for example, here on Angus Reed's main homepage, you see like uh, what people think if they're going to catch Omicron in the next month or so, 55% of people seem that they're going to get in, feel think that they're going to get infected. It's not the percentage that are infected. It's the people who think they're going to get infected by Omicron in the next little while, regardless of what they or the government does. And so that's like a public opinion survey, right? And there is some data here on religion. So on Angus's Reed's website, you can go under issues, and that's how you search by subject. And they have a faith and values um, topic, which is where they kind of put a lot of their polling on religion and faith. And so, for example, the last one that's here that they did was um, last Easter, so in April in 2021. They're, you know, asking, they got a, a, a sample of people who used to attend religious services pre-pandemic quite regularly. And they were asking them, you know, like, you know, have you been attending virtually? Are you going to go back in person once the pandemic is over? Um, things like that uh, related to their religious service attendance and their kind of you know, beliefs and, and faith and uh, what they're thinking, how important religion has been to them during the pandemic uh, and that and so on and so forth. So that's like another source. So you can click on this report of theirs. And so you'll get in the report, you'll get like statistics, you get like some percentages, you'll get some nice data visuals. Um, so a lot of different information that you might be interested in that might be helpful Again, part of like a literature review you would do on a topic if it interests you. So this, when you click on it on the website, they give you the, their initial report. Um, if you scroll all the way down to the bottom of the page, like I just did, you can also uh, click the full complete report. Here it is. To read the full report, including details, table, and methodology, you can click on it. And that brings you to a PDF that's like more information, that's a longer report with more details, including how the survey was run. So for example, in this case, it wasn't just Angus Reed running the survey, uh, CARDIS, uh, which is like um, uh, a group in Ottawa. It's like a think tank that's like funded by evangelical Christians. Uh, they also helped run the survey, for example, if you're curious where the, where the money came from for the survey, because surveys are expensive to run sometimes. So that's Angus Reed. So that's, uh, and there's lots of other available options, right? I think in my slides, I'm switching back to my slides here. I've got like Pew is another big one, right? The Pew Research Center. They have lots of data, some just on the US, but also on world religions, including in Canada. Uh, so yeah, so lots of good data out there that's all freely available, that's on their website, that's already been analyzed by their teams of people. Now, if you're doing research with a group or an organization, it's always worth asking them to see what they've got in terms of numbers. Like they have, like lots of groups keep their numbers, some of which they make public on their websites, some of which they don't. Um, but if you're, you know, part of a research group or if you're doing your own research, it's always good to ask them to see what they've got. And often I've done this a number of times and the groups I've worked with have been happy to share this data. It's not always the case, but often they are. They're just happy someone's interested. Maybe, you know, no one's ever actually tallied the data for them in Excel. <laughs> you're the one who ends up tallying the data for them in Excel and giving them a few percentages. And so you're also helping them out at the same time by giving them a bit of an overview of what's going on with their group organization or church or community. And so, you know, it's always worth, worth asking, you know, there's the available resources online that I just showed you, but there's often like people keep numbers sometimes. And so it's, they don't always make it easily pub available publicly, but if you ask for it, they're happy to give it to you uh, on a lot of occasions. So it's worth asking, depending on which groups you're working with. I uh, don't ask Mormons. If you're working, if you're studying Mormons, they will not share their data with you, just a heads up. Uh, but most other groups are usually pretty open to it. Uh, just quick shameless self-promotion before we move on here to our next section. Uh, I've also got some stats out recently. I was working with the World Values Survey uh, as well as the European Values Survey. These are big international data sets. Um, there are big surveys that are run in, in this case, if you combine the two in 81 countries and they run the same survey or a very similar survey across all 81 countries. They did it between 2017 and 2020. And for the first time in a long time, Canada was included. Often Canada is 
not part of these international surveys, but it was. Uh, this time we have Guy Lachapelle at Concordia University to thank for that. Um, so he got us back into the World Value Surveys, which is great. And so I crunched some of those numbers. If you're curious, you can go and download the report. It's like a, about a 12 page long report. It's on my university uh, digital repository. So it's free, you can view it or you can download it as a PDF. And so it's got some numbers some, on some recent religiosity indicators. The nice thing about the World Value Surveys is that's like lots of questions about religion. So it's things like belief in God, life after death, um, you know, your usual frequency of religious service attendance, Christian affiliation, Muslim affiliation, no religion, rates of no religion. And so it gives you the recent rates of Canada. I, I had broke it down by region. So you have it between the regions that were sampled for the World Value Survey within Canada. And you also can compare Canada to the 80 other countries in the data set to see where Canada's at in terms of ranking and who they compare to when it comes to those key indicators. So another source of data that's already been analyzed, in this case by me. This was my like Christmas project because of Omicron. Like all my, I had to cancel all my family and friend visits over Christmas. It's kind of sad. You know, I'm a good public citizen. So like, I'm not going to go and spread the virus. So I'll cancel all my fun stuff I had planned over the holidays. And instead I did this. <laughs> so this is my, I love stats. So it was kind of fun, but it was also kind of sad because it was on my own. I'm like, I can't visit anyone. Um, just my immediate family. Um, but, uh, but this is what came out of it. So it's my little uh, pandemic Omicron gift to everyone. Hopefully there's a silver lining to everything, right? Okay. So now you notice that um, kind of Chris, your question was a little bit in this direction, but the you know what's on the websites and what's already been analyzed by others sometimes is a bit limited, right? Uh, notably, on StatsCan website, you can only see like one variable at a time, right? So you can see the number of Muslims uh, in a in a certain region or the number of people who say they have no religion in a certain region, um, but you uh, you can't necessarily see how uh, amongst say 15 year olds or people between the ages of 15 and 25, how many of them say they're no religion. We couldn't see that in that uh, census profile tool. We can only see like one variable at a time. So you can see the number of people who say they have no religion. You can calculate the percentage based on that because you have the number in the category, you have the total population number above. So you calculate the percentage, divide the category by the total population, multi multiply it by a hundred, and you get the rate of no religion or the rate of Muslims or whichever group you're interested in. Um, uh, but again, like you can't, if you're interested in crossing two variables, like seeing like, okay, within a certain age group, how many uh, affiliate with Anglicanism or something else, um, that you can't do uh, using the census profile option or like that there's a friend so that doesn't require like a whole lot of stats training to be able to do it. So what the tool that I use that you have access to through many Canadian universities as students, and this is through your libraries at the universities is Odyssey. So Odyssey is, um, it's like a data portal, a data retrieval uh, website, and we'll go to it in a few moments together. And this is where you can get StatsCan data, so you can download the raw forms of the data. You can also, they have a tabulation uh, feature where you can cross variables quite easily together. And so to get, say, if you're interested in how many of the 15 to 25-year-olds, uh, the rate uh, who say they have no religion, you can relatively easily get that using the tabulation feature in Odyssey. So I I'm not sure how widespread Odyssey is. I know that it's definitely at most of the main uh, larger Canadian universities. Um, I, it's, it's at some of the smaller ones as well. It's quite widespread. Uh, so you should be able to find it on your university's um, library's website. Just put in Odyssey and you should be able to find it. Uh, you can always ask your librarian for help uh, if you're looking for it. And if you don't have Odyssey, access to Odyssey, which is a specific data portal, uh, you probably have access to something quite similar. So there's different ways to access these statistics data portals. Um, there's different ones, but... It, they're all pretty quite similar and Odyssey is the most common, I think. And so you, I know definitely, for example, you know, um, so it's there. So that's why I figured I'd show it to you because it's quite widely available. Again, it's kind of part of your tuition fees. So you have access to it for free through your university uh, library. Okay, so let's go uh, have a quick look. Um, so I'm gonna switch my screen again. Da, 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 da. So we'll go back to my web browser. And I have the next one open. Give me a sec here. I'm just working on one screen today, so it's not the largest. Here we go. So you should be able now to see the Odyssey data portal. Now, this is what it looks like from the University of Waterloo. And once you click 
click on it, this is usually what it looks like from any university that you access. It's usually the same book. Um, Corey Steele and I confirmed this when we're looking at it together on Zoom uh, before the holidays, uh, is that it does look the same at Ottawa as it does at Waterloo. And so again, you, you kind of search for it through your library. If you can't find it, ask your librarian. They can help you out. Kind of like when you're looking for a book. If you have trouble finding a book, you ask your librarian, either virtually or in person. Same goes for a stats uh, web uh, data portal like this. If you have trouble finding it, just ask your librarian. And how it works is that on the left-hand side, you have all the kind of subject areas or topics. And then here in the middle, you have like a working window where like things will appear, like variables and your cross tabs as, as you use them. So you'll, we'll, we'll do some stuff together on it and you'll see. So, okay, so um, say I'm interested in knowing that rate of people who say they have no religion amongst a younger age group in Canada. So there's all different data here. Some of it's stats can data. As you can see, for example, census of the population, that'll be, okay, uh, <laughs> there's an error, but anyways, that's where the StatScan data usually appears for the census data. Um, but there's also like lots of other data sets that are not necessarily statistics scanned here. So if you're interested, you can browse, find different data on the topics uh, that you work with. I'm going to go and look at these social surveys here. Um, and usually the list, oh no, it's not working. Ah, oh no, fail. Okay, hang on. I'm going to retry it. Bear with me, people. We're going to click out and we're going to try it again. So you can see how I search for Odyssey at the same time. <laughs> I'm going to try, I'm going to try reusing the page. So I'm accessing Odyssey through the University of Waterloo's page, Odyssey data retrieval. Let's see if it works again. It's maybe just because I had, hopefully, because I had the page open too long. Let's see if it works now. Yes, it works. Okay, so back on Odyssey main page. Sorry about that. Uh, you get to see all the behind the scenes action <laughs> of the joys of teaching statistics. Um, so yeah, so on the left here, I've, I'm under social surveys. I want Canada and I'm going towards the general social surveys because I know that it has variables on religion and religiosity in Canada and it's a relatively good quality survey. Now, obviously I know this because I've been working in this field in Canada for over a decade now. And so there's obviously some researching that you need to do, right? reading up on, seeing what other data sets people are using in existing publications, seeing what's available, exploring StatsCan's website, exploring all these different options that are available to you in terms of data sets, and then finding the one that has the variables you want that's a relatively good quality, right? So variables on topics you're interested in, like religion or non-religion. So that's kind of, you know, I'm going through this relatively quickly. I know it's the general social survey I want. Um, but this is something you kind of have to learn over the years. And if you're ever wondering about these things, you can ask me. I have a quite good knowledge of all these different data sets. You can ask another expert, someone like Peter Bayer at Ottawa knows these data sets quite well. Sam Reimer at Crandall University as well. Um, but anyways, ask around and even outside your discipline, and they might have a good sense of, okay, which data sets would be best for depending what kind of information you're after. So a general social survey, the most recent one that has been released uh, on Odyssey is, the, is this 2018 Giving, Volunteering, and Participation uh, GSS. So that's cycle 33. So again, I'm clicking on these little plus signs next to it to give me kind of more information. And then finally, I get to the actual survey. So I click on it and it gives you in the center here information about the survey. So again, you kind of scroll through your options. And then when you find the one you want, you click on the little plus signs until you get to the data set that interests you, right? So this gives a summary of the survey itself. Um, and you know, the whole of the data set. And then below it, you'll see this kind of metadata and variable description. Let's go to variable description. Okay. And then we have all the different variables that are included in the 2018 general social survey. So now you have to find religion. Sometimes religion has its own little thing. Ah, it does here, excellent. Sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes religion is under like demography and population. So you just have to browse for it until you get to it. But say here under religion, I've pressed the plus sign. I get to the different religion variables. There's three in the 2018 GSS. So I click on religious affiliation flag. And here is the variable, right? People were asked, you know, what if any is your religion? Um, and here are the results, right? So we can see then the survey, uh, there's uh, just under 11,000 respondents who had a religious affiliation of some kind and just under 4,000 who had no religious affiliation. Now, unfortunately, this is as much detail as we get 
in the public version of it. So if you wanted more detail about, say, like the rate of Sikhs or the number of Sikhs um, in this sample, uh, that's when you'd have to access the data uh, at the research data center uh, with the security check to make sure that you're keeping, respecting the confidentiality of respondents, uh, which I'll talk more about at the end just before we go. And so, you know, this is, you're kind of stuck a bit with this. So you kind of work with what you got. If this is what you want, great. If it's not what you want, well, you, you evaluate if, if going further is worth the time and effort. Um, if it is, then you do it. Uh, if not, then you kind of just live with it and, and, and do something else uh, for your own work, right? It's always kind of your judgment. How much time and effort am I willing to put into this? Because again, it is all free, but it is kind of, some of it requires a lot more effort effort and time than others, right? But here I do have the, the, the category of people who have no religious affiliation. And so uh, now I can see that on its own, right? I can see that just under 4,000 respondents, and this is of all the people who answered the survey, said they had no religious affiliation. But I can also start crossing these variables with other demographic or other variables that interest me in the survey. And that, to do that, use this tabulation tool that's at the top here. So I'm, at the moment, we're under description. You click on tabulation instead here, right, at the top middle. That's where I clicked on it. And then this is building what we call a cross tab, right? So this is where you cross two, maybe three or four, if you're really into it, variables. And so you can start breaking down that, re that religious affiliation question between other variables like gender, education, or in my case, age. So I'm interested in age. So I'm going to go and find my age variable. So again, under variable description are all the variables that are included in the GSS in 2018. And age is usually under demographic variables. There we go, age group, six categories. Okay, let's do that. And then if you click on it, the variable you want, and you say add to row, this will only show up if you're in the tabulation option. But when you are in tabulation, you can click on a variable and add to row and it'll show up in the table, right? So now I have my age group shown up, right? My different 10 year age groups in my table. And then for my column, I'm gonna go and choose my religion variable. So I'm gonna click on religious flag, add to column. We'll see if this works. If not, we'll just have to switch it up. That happens sometimes. You can just sometimes play around with this, right? But here I have, you know, um, I have currently, I have what we call the column percentages. Right. So this is probably not what people had in mind. This is um, more like, OK, of all the people who are religiously affiliated, who add up to 100 percent at the bottom of the column of this column, um, 4 percent are between the ages of 15 and 24 years old. Right. So that's one type of percentage you can get out of this. But another one under type here, this little window, you can click on it and you can ask for the row percentage instead. And so that changes the data. And this is probably more what I wanted is it's a it adds up to 100% at the end of each row. So you interpret this slightly differently, right? This is amongst 15 to 24 year olds, 43% say they have no religious affiliation in the 2018 general social survey, right? 57% are religiously affiliated, which adds up to 100 uh, if you add both, right? So you play around with it a bit, right? Keep in mind, these are slight variations, but they can have a big difference on how you interpret a number, right? So these, that's always the thing with cross tabs is it's, it's always, it always mixes everyone up. It's okay, it mixes me up sometimes still, and I've been doing this for a long time. Uh, sometimes you see a column percentage, it's like, ah, uh, no, I need the row percentage, and you switch them around. So you make sure that you look at the table carefully, that you actually understand what the table is telling you, and then you would interpret it accordingly, right? But this is something you can do uh, for free. Uh, that's relatively easy, right? Um, and you just play around with it. And obviously, you know, I don't know if any of you have this open at the moment, you're playing around with it now, but take the time. All the links are in the slides and, and go and have, go explore and try this out. And you can also add more variables too. So say I want to add gender in there uh, as another row variable. Uh, here we go. We have gender of respondent, add to row. Let's see what that does, right? Then you get age group and then dividing within the age group, you get the gender as well, right? So you can see that the rate of no religion amongst 15 to 24 year olds is pretty similar between men and women, right? It's, that hasn't changed a whole lot. And it's both kind of roughly 43%, okay? So that was Odyssey. So anyways, like I say, go play around with it. There's a few other features, you know, I won't, I don't want to spend forever on this, but it is worth going exploring, playing around with, seeing what you can do because a lot of you have access to it for free and it's relatively easy. Pretty much anyone can use it. 
Okay, questions. Let me quickly check the chat, but feel free to jump in at any time, unmute yourself and do questions. There's some more resources being shared. Thank you, people. That's great. Um, okay, so Parnia has a question. Oh, I'll read it first because it was directly messaged to me. I uh, for stats. Okay. Okay, yeah, Parnia, back to the kind of question that Chris had earlier on as well. So Parnia is looking for stats of specific Muslim communities, not just Muslim or Islam overall, but specific ones. And uh, Parnia, uh, I'll, the third section, we'll talk a little bit about that. Unfortunately, that level of detail is not usually released on StatsCan's website. And it's also something that you don't find regularly in smaller surveys like the public opinion institutes run like Angus Reid or Leger because their samples tend to be quite a bit smaller. And when they are, uh, those smaller samples like say of 2,500 respondents are not great at capturing minorities, unfortunately. It means that there's not a whole lot of people who say identify with Islam or specifically like of a specific Islamic uh, tradition. And so, yeah, there, you can still act, you can still get the number of say in the census data of how many specifically identified as Ismaili or uh, in the Sufi tradition or whichever group that you're interested in, there's quite amount of detail, but you do have to access that in the kind of more secure setting of the research data center. I'll talk about them in a moment. They're basically computer labs that are, there's a few across the country and you need to get a security check before you go and do that to make sure again, that you're kind of respecting the confidentiality of respondents so that you're not gonna misuse the data because they don't just wanna make that public to everyone because then like a bunch of marketing companies would be trying to use this to like sell very specific things to specific people. And you know, some people might have an affair various purposes and might want to know where certain groups are specifically for the wrong reasons. And so StatsCan has to protect against that. So I'll talk more about that in a moment. But yeah, unfortunately, there is only a certain level of detail that you can get um, through StatsCan and publicly on their website. And we were you can see it when you explore it there. And uh, you'll get a bit more detail with the public opinion institutes. But it's not super helpful for minorities because the, their samples aren't as good. So they're probably not as representative for minority groups, like groups that are like say under 20% of the population, for example, you still can get some information, but it's not the best quality. Yeah. You know, if any of this I'm saying is like, if you still don't understand it, feel free to like follow up questions. It's okay too. <laughs> like, you know, I'm used to talking about this stuff all the time, but I'm never sure if like beginners who aren't, don't use this as much, how much they're follow, able to follow along or not. So if you need me to explain anything, anything more, just let me know. Okay. All right. So I'm not seeing any other questions in the chat. So I'm going to go back to the slides. We're getting close to the end now, people. We're, we're not far. We're almost there. So don't despair. I just put in the slide, I just put up a screenshot of what it looks like, what Odyssey looks like and should look like for most of you. But again, if you're starting out with looking for these sorts of things, um, just contact your librarian. Usually there's a librarian at university that specializes in, in statistics. And so contact them or someone else who can put you in touch with them. And like trying to find a book for the first time, they can help you out to try and find some of this data for the first time, and show you what the options are at your university. Okay, and finally, uh, I won't spend a huge amount of time on this, but just so you kind of know, there's let's let's talk. I've I've hinted at it. I've talked a little bit about it, but let's talk about you know what do you do if you actually really do want some of that more detailed information that's not available on StatsCan's website or on other freely available, easy to access sources that we've just seen, um, but that you still and and you're willing that you is worthwhile enough that you'd like to put in you know, a few hours, um, sometimes many hours to go and get and analyze yourself. Because the next slides, Odyssey, for example, um, and you've looked around and you can't find it, um, but, you know, it is potentially available because it does exist in a survey. And then it's time to go and get the actual survey data file and do the analysis yourself, right? So that's what I do for a living. Like my main research is going and getting these data sets, either ones I've, gen I've generated myself by running my own survey or just through StatsCan. I use the general social survey quite a bit, for example. And going and getting the raw data, the data in its raw form, if you will, and crunching the numbers with stats models, right? And so that's what you end up having to do if, you know, what you want is not easily and freely available and has already been 
been analyzed and put on the website by StatsCan or by another group, right? And so this is where you have to decide, you know, is it worth your time and effort? Because it's quite a bit of time and effort. Um, but if it is, then, then great. And if you want, it's a whole area of potential research, right? So like that's, I just do this for a living. <laughs> I love this kind of thing. Um, but for like someone who is not so much into the quantitative research, who does more qualitative, you know, you have to decide if this is worth uh, the time investment because it is a bigger time investment. But let's talk a little bit about it. I won't get into a huge amount of it, just to give you a sense of what's possible. Right. So this is where, you know, you get that the data file has already been created by someone else, like a survey that stats can run, like that 2018 general social survey. You get it in, it's kind of what we call a data set or data file format. Right. And so you download that for free and you have it on your computer and or your university's computer and you analyze it with statistical software yourself. Right. So you end up doing the number crunching. Right. Everything we've seen so far, someone else has done the number crunching. But at this point, it's you that has to go and do it because no one else has done it before. Um, and so you can't find it in existing publications or online. Right. Um, so, you know, if, if this is what you want, uh, then you go in and download that file. Again, it's not necessarily behind a paywall, but it is does take more of your time and, and know-how to do this. And it's what we call secondary analysis. So what is a data set? What does it look like exactly? Um, it's like a fancy word uh, for a, a spreadsheet, <laughs> basically. Um, it's, uh, it, it's, you know, there's terms we use for these things, data matrix, data set, data file. A lot of us use those interchangeably as synonyms. So if you hear that, this is what we're actually referring to. It's like a fancy term for a, a nice spreadsheet, basically where each row in the spreadsheet is a respondent or a unit of analysis. So often an individual. So for example, in a survey, each person who answered the survey. And then in each row is their answer to a survey question. So in each row is their variable, is a variable that you, know, you get their answer to. So, you know, I know it's pretty small here, but so for example, here in this six, uh, in this data set, uh, number, the first row, number one here is referring to our first respondent and they live in region number 10, which I know refers, 10 is the common number we give to Newfoundland and Labrador in StatsCan's data sets. And so number 10, it means that this respondent lives in Newfoundland and Labrador, right? So it's really each row is a respondent, each column is their answer to a survey question or depending on the type of data set, their value on some kind of variable and it's all numerically coded right because we're, we're crunching numbers here so these numbers can be just numbers in themselves so like age right age will be just the answer will be a number right so this respondent is 18 years old uh, or the number can refer to a category in which case you have a separate code book that tells you which numbers are which categories so for example number 10 here refers to Newfoundland and Labrador right the province and so that's what a data set is. And so, you know, it's an Excel spreadsheet. You can analyze it in Excel uh, a little bit. It's Excel is not great, but there is a little bit of analysis you can do. But usually we use more advanced statistical software to, to crunch this data. A software like R, like Stata, SPSS, SAS, those are all software, uh, right? You just, you know, usually it's proprietary, so you have to pay some money for it. All except R is free, but the others, Stata, SPSS, you have to pay for. Often your university will have a license. So ask your university about it. Sometimes you can use it on their computer labs or you can remote network uh, access uh, the remote desktop uh, through your university that has this paid software on it already so that you don't have to pay. But sometimes you end up having to pay. If you're part of a research group, sometimes the research group will pay. Um, and so, uh, so yeah, and then you crunch the numbers using that statistical software. And by crunching them, I mean like you can do the cross tabs that we did in Odyssey, but you can do much more. You can do higher level, more complex analyses where you're, you know, not only going into a certain level of detail, but you're also, you know, doing a more advanced analysis. It's like, okay, you know, uh, does age impact the rate of people who say they have no religion? Once I control for like region of residence, income, education, once a control for all these other variables. Spoiler alert, it does. Age has a big impact. It's a cohort effect for the most part. Uh, younger people say they have no religion at higher rates. But is that still there once I've, you know, controlled for all these other potential factors that could impact how people uh, affiliate uh, or not with a religion? Right? So with StatsCan data specifically, um, they have 
different versions of these data sets, right? Just to make it a little bit more complicated for you. But if ever you're really curious about this stuff, shoot me an email. I'm happy to answer more questions about it. So there's a public version of the data set that you can download directly from Odyssey. I'll show you in a moment how to do that. But that public version is freely available, very easily accessible. And it has the same variables in it that we looked at together in Odyssey, right? So your religious affiliation question only has two categories, affiliated or not affiliated. So it's a public version of the data set of the 2018 General Social Survey, but it doesn't have as much detail in it, in it, again, to protect the confidentiality of respondents, so you can't identify one specific type of person. So that you can download for free and just crunch that with your stats software. Or if you want the full detailed version of the StatsCan data, so that can be any survey they run, any institutional level they, data they have, health data, uh, immigration data, tax data. Uh, there's like a whole bunch that's out there and it's all great data, um, but it's, it's also protected in the sense that you have to go to those, what we call the research data centers. I've put the link down there if you wanna go and explore and see what they are. Uh, but the, there's one, there's quite a few across the country. So there's usually one in the major city that's closest to you. Not always, but often. So there's one at Ottawa, there's one at Waterloo, there's one in Toronto, there's one in Montreal, uh, there's one in, in, in Victoria, BC, I think. There's one in Vancouver, too. Um, there, there's, there's some across the country, and there's a list. Uh, you can go to the link there. And basically what they are is they're like, <laughs> they feel like 1990s computer labs, basically. It's a computer lab. You access it through a secure door with a fob. You arrive, and the, the computers don't have internet on them. So you can't send anything out. The whole point is that you do your analyses in the computer lab, in the closed computer lab. And then to get them out, so to get them out to publish or to, you know, once into your regular computer that has internet, internet, uh, you have to send them through the StatsCan employees. So it was like a StatsCan employee. It's like really like a weird thing. They have like their own desk in like class and they're watching you as you're, <laughs> as you're doing your analyses on the computer. And then you send it to them and they check to make sure that you're not, uh, you know, not uh, hurt, um, infringing on anyone's confidentiality, that, you know, you've rounded all your numbers properly. Um, and then they will say like, okay, it's good, Sarah, I will send you this data now to your, they have internet on their own computer. So they send it to me and then I can use that data in a publication and more analyses and that sort of thing. So it's a bit of a process. You have to apply to have that access, right? So that usually takes a few weeks to a few months, depending on, on what you're applying for. And in the application form, you state kind of what data you want to use, what you're using it for. And so that's where I say like, it's, it's, it's a certain amount of time and effort. And so it may not be, you know, depending on how much info, how much you want this data, it may or may not be, be, be worth it for you. But it is possible. So if you do want to do it, uh, it's usually possible. And so you just got to take these steps. It's all kind of on their website, but you can also ask your librarian about it. Uh, they'll get you in touch with your nearest research data center. And the StatsCan employee is usually very helpful, and they're happy to answer any questions you have about how it works and, and, and if what you want is possible in this case. So it takes a certain amount of time, effort, and also, you know, you have to be close to one of these research data centers. They're sort of throughout the country, but they're not everywhere either. The other thing you need for this is obviously training, right? So, um, you know, I've had, right, I've started my stats training, like in theory, in 2004, uh, even before that, because I was in advanced stats in high school. Um, but, you know, I really started specializing in quantitative methods during my MA, which was 2008. And I've been training ever since, right? Like as a quantitative researcher, your training is ongoing because there's new stats models that come out. There's some that you never got to see. So you learn as you go. And, you know, obviously, as you move forward with your training, it becomes easier because you come, become more familiar with this. So it's easier to learn. Like it's much easier for me to pick up a new stats model about how to do something now than it was, you know, when I was in my early 20s. Um, but, you know, it's, it's definitely there. So to do, I don't want to scare anyone away because that's not the point here. The training is available and it is out there if it's something you want to do but it does take a certain amount of time, right? Statistical analysis is a certain skill that not everyone has um, yet, and that you do have to develop with a certain amount of training and often hands-on training of like, okay, how do you use the stats model, right? How do you apply the software to the raw data? How do you crunch these numbers? And how do you properly interpret them, right? That's the other big thing is that, you know, it's one thing just to put out numbers, right? But the, the numbers only tell you so much. There's limits to everything, right? Including what these numbers tell you. So to be able to recognize that and to be able to make sure that you're not overstating uh, the results or, or saying things that these numbers aren't actually showing you or telling you. 
And so, you know, that, that, that the training exists, but it's not training that you often get in religious studies. Uh, that's kind of something that I'm trying to change <laughs> slowly, but I don't think I ever will fully succeed in that front. Um, but religious studies doesn't offer this training, but social science programs do. Right, so in sociology at Waterloo, for example, you have to take at least one stats course at the BA level, another one at the MA level, and there's more available either through the University of Waterloo or through summer schools or through other universities. And so, you know, if you are interested in, say, taking a course for a term on how to start doing these analyses using these the software like SPSS, Data, uh, SAS, R, uh, the, probably at your university there are courses being offered just probably outside your department if you're in religious studies. So uh, any of the big social science uh, departments, uh, like sociology, psychology, political science, they all have stats courses at different levels. So you can ask them, be like, hey, can I audit this BA beginner stats, uh, stats analysis with SPSS? Um, and you know, often, not always, but often the, the, your university is happy to oblige, the instructor is happy to help. Um, and so you can learn it and you can take them in any discipline because they're all pretty similar. Don't do economics. Economics is very different <laughs> and awful in terms of stats training. Uh, uh, that's my own personal opinion. Uh, but but in psychology, political science, sociology, they're all pretty similar. You can attend any stats course, beginner stats course in them, and they're all pretty much showing you the same thing. You get a data set, how to crunch it, how to produce statistics from it that are more what you want and what you need, right? But it does require a certain amount of training. And so, you know, be ready for it if it's worth, you know, if you really want to do this, if it's something Thing you want, then it's worth your, your time and investment. Um, but it might not be. And so we just stick with what's available to you on the website or through Odyssey or kind of what's been published uh, in existing journals. Okay, so that was it for me. Um, you know, you got my email there at the end of the slides. Please feel free to contact me anytime with questions. But we hopefully have like 10 minutes left for QA <laughs> for any questions, maybe five, <laughs> but we've got time. So if anyone's got any questions, shoot them. Come on, it can be in the chat. I'll, I'll open the chat. I'll keep an up, update with the chat. Or you can just unmute yourself, raise your hand, whatever you want to do it. We'll find you somehow. Sarah, do you know if uh, public libraries have any of these stats programs? Probably not, Walter. Um, you know, you never know, right? Some public libraries are amazing and have stuff that you never expect. But no, I think it's mostly university computer labs that will have them. Yeah. But if you want, R is free, eh? the, the one that's just called the letter R, uh, that's a free software and there's lots of, it's, it's got a very vibrant online community. So if it's something you want to actually put time and effort into, you can learn it and you, you, it's a free app and, and there's no need to, to pay anything for it. Okay, I'm just going to go through the chat, but if anyone else wants to jump in with a question or a follow-up question. For any like beginner beginners beyond taking a course, do you have any like books that you would consider name dropping of like, this is a good intro textbook or just like any of them are fine, I'm sure. Yeah, if anyone's interested, you can email me and I'll send you a list. I don't have it in front of me, so I can't put in the chat right now. But um, the thing with stats is that it's harder to learn by books, right? So I don't... This is in no way me commenting on qualitative methods. I, I love qualitative methods. I work with people who do qualitative methods. I teach introductory qualitative methods along with stats. However, it is much easier to learn qualitative methods from a book. Um, it, it's not, not everything is e possible that front. Sometimes you want the hands-on experience with a, an expert. Um, but qualitative methods, you know, for the most part, when you want to learn, hey, like, hey, what's the best strategy to do focus groups? It's quite easy to find a, a, a text and read it. For stats analysis, it's a little bit more complicated because the stats analysis, there are great textbooks out there. And depending, you know, they go by software, right? So if you want to learn SPSS, I've got a few for SPSS. You want to learn state. I've got a few first data. So they'll explain what the statistics are, how you crunch the numbers to get the statistic you're looking for, how you interpret it. Um, but there's, there is like a hands-on aspect to it that's difficult to pick up from books. Again, if you've been doing stats for a long time, it's easier for me to pick something up from a book because I know some of the basics. But if you haven't, I would recommend taking a course. Um, it can be like it can be like a week-long intensive summer school course. Those are out there, especially through U of T. Um, or if it's like a term course, um, and it's good to have like often that hands-on person, like 
the person who's there who can help you because you will encounter some problems. Like there'll be troubleshooting you'll need to get through because, you know, it's, it's, you know, there's little fiddly things sometimes that you need to pick up. So I would, yeah, I will like anyone shoot me an email. Again, my email's in the slides. You can email me anytime. I'll send you some resources, but a heads up that you probably will need a bit, of, at least a bit of help. Uh, so that can be either from like a supervisor or a mentor who knows stats who you're working with or, in the same building with who you might know, or it can be a course, uh, an introductory course in the social sciences. Yeah. That's a good question, Chris. Oh yeah, okay, so um, I got a question about the GSS. So the cycle, uh, give me a sec here, I'm just scrolling through the questions. Okay, so wait, no, Parnia has a follow-up question. So um, wondering if, um, you know, stats of a particular religious group who immigrated Canada in a particular year are available. Uh, not quite, Parnia. I think the most detail you can get through StatsCan's website, um, it's not necessarily on the census profile that we looked at, but if you if you type in migration in keywords, you'll get a bunch of data, and, and some of that data will be like the number of migrants who enter and um, the number of immigrants who enter the country each year. I don't think they count how many people leave. That's interesting. No, they don't have a way of counting that, but they do have a, a way of counting who, how many people are landed immigrants versus, you know, uh, permanent residents and citizens. And so they'll break that down by year but they probably won't break it down by religious group so unfortunately like there's again there's only so much detail that you can get but look because you never know maybe like one stats can employee was really into it and so produced a table with it <laughs> you might get lucky but probably you just get the number of immigrant uh, of immigrants in a certain region or province each year yeah. so that was Parney's question just going through. Okay, so in Odyssey, what does it mean, the word cycle? Many categories have subcategories that say cycle, 25, 26, 27. Uh, I'm not, the cycle can be used in different ways uh, on Odyssey. So when I, when we looked at like say cycle 33 of the GSS, that's just the name of the general social survey. They, they call each wave each year a cycle. So it's the 33rd time that the GSS has been run. Uh, apart from that here, I'll have a quick look. I'm not seeing necessarily exactly where it means, but yeah, I just kind of, I don't know if there's anything. I'm just looking through description. I think usually what they're referring to in the cycle is, yeah, the GSS is called the cycle and each wave is, so like cycle 33 refers to the fact that, um, that the GSS has been run. This is the 33rd time the GSS has been run. So I think that's what you're seeing. Uh, ba -ba 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 -ba. Okay. All right, I must put up the link to sign up for the NCF mailing list. Good job, it's always a good thing to do. Okay, Frederick asks, so do the public use microdata files or the full files at the RDCs allow for tracking the same individuals over time or is it only one year at a time? Great question, Frederick. It's only one year at a time. Unfortunately, Canada does not do what we call longitudinal data a whole lot. It has some. So like I think tax data, you can like link the files and track an individual over time, like their different income tax filings over the years. Um, but it's quite rare. So if you want, especially on religion data, there is no longitudinal data. The last longitudinal data we had on religion in Canada was actually Reg Beebe, who was running the Project Canada survey series uh, from like the mid 70s to the mid 2000s. That data had some sampling issues, but it was kind of the only longitudinal data that exists. And longitudinal data is you, you follow an individual over time. So instead of surveying new individuals each year, you survey the same individuals over time. So you ask them similar questions over each year, or every five years, every 10 years, or you ask them new questions or a combination of both. Unfortunately, Canada doesn't do a whole lot of that. Other countries like say Germany, or the Netherlands or some of the Scandinavian countries, they will have lots of great, amazing longitudinal data. And it's like the best quality data because then you can really see like, okay, I can tell like when something changed in their life, like it led to this other change a few years later, right? You can really pinpoint cause and effect. You can establish time order, right? The problem often that we have with like this cross-sectional data, like the GSS, is that it's hard to see say what came first, right? So if someone... I don't know, um, has a lower income and is also very actively religious, you know, like is, okay, one, is there actually cause and effect there or not? And if there is, what direction does it go? And is it because someone has a lower income that they're more religious that leads them to higher religiosity to kind of create alternative forms of social capital, social support, and like a, uh, a supernatural safety net, if you will. Um, 
Or is it that, you know, those who uh, attend religious services are coming from, especially in Canada now, more minority immigrant communities, and those are groups that are also more vulnerable in our society that tend on average to have lower incomes, right? So there's can be two, like a link between variables can mean, can mean like the cause effect goes different ways. And so it's very hard to tell that. So you'd have to like track individuals over time to be able to tell like what came first. And so that data we don't have, unfortunately, not a whole lot, especially on religion. It's uh, and it's very expensive and hard to get now, right? Because, you know, you have to the individual has to answer the survey, has to keep answering the survey every year, or every five years. And most individuals now lose interest. Some don't, but many do. And so it's very expensive too to kind of keep track of them and to make sure they fill out the survey every so often. So it's there's a reason we don't collect much of it anymore. It's because stats can decide that their resources could be better used elsewhere, but it's sad because we don't have that data necessarily in Canada. And it's it does exist in other countries, but it's quite rare. Okay, anyone else want to jump in? I think those are all the chat questions, but I think we're coming to the end of the workshop. But again, shoot me an email if you want to know anything more. I'm always happy to help. And uh, we can call that the the end of the workshop. Hopefully it was helpful and hopefully you enjoyed at least parts of it. <laughs> Thank you so much, Sarah. I just have a little bit of quick housekeeping before we wrap up today. Um, so as Sarah mentioned, I shared the email address for our information officer, Amy, in the chat. If you'd like to hear about upcoming NCF uh, workshops, lectures, and events, um, that's where you'll hear it. So please add yourself to our mailing list. Um, we've got a lot of exciting stuff coming up this year. On that note, I'd just like to quickly plug tomorrow's virtual lecture. So tomorrow at 12 p.m. Eastern, we have a virtual lecture um, called Keeping the Faith, Religious Belief and Practice in Canada During the COVID-19 Pandemic. If you got the quantitative bug today, this will be a great lecture to attend. Um, Jack Judd Webb from the Association of Canadian Studies will be talking about a series of studies um, from 2019 to 2021 comparing uh, various measures of religious belief and practice in Canada. And we'll be exploring um, how or whether these changed during the pandemic. Um, so it's very timely. It's going to be a great event, and we hope to see you there. Um, I'm just going to share the registration link in the chat. Feel free to email me or Amy if you'd like more information. Um, and with that, I'm going to hand things over to our student caucus leader, Lauren Strumos, uh, for a quick concluding thank you. Great, thanks, Emma. Um, yeah, hi, everyone. I'm Lauren Strumos. I'm the student caucus leader for the Non-Religion in a Complex Future project, um, also the student representative for the CCSR. Just wanted to say thank you very much, Sarah, for taking the time to be here today and leading this workshop. Um, truly, it was very helpful. Um, I'm doing qualitative research for my doctoral project and very much have that qualitative brain in that I find statistics um, or even just Excel spreadsheets, <laughs> often very intimidating, but I was able to follow along today. Um, and having you walk us through the Stats Canada website and the Odyssey portal was um, particularly helpful. So thank you so much again.